Welcome to the Steve and Samino Says Boom Show issue number 62. Steve? Boom. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Pop XP. And before the show starts, make sure to click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome new content. And don't forget, if you can, make sure to share our stream on all your social media outlets. We appreciate it, and thanks for helping us grow the Pop XP channel. Welcome, everybody, to the Steve Insomino Says Boom Show issue number 62. Uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful uh, guest host right here that's going to uh, – our, our mentor and our uh, mascot is here that's going to uh, take us on a journey. But before we do that, Niall, what's going on, brother? I'll tell you what's going on. Everyone, you know the house rules. Please look below. Click that subscribe button and smash that bell so you get notifications when we go live and we upload awesome episodes like tonight's. And I'm ready to dive in, gentlemen. It's been a while since we've done one of these, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Now, Steve, before we get into this, where Mr. Thomas is going to take us on this journey, what was what do you think Conan meant at the time especially during the 70s how you're such a great historian tell me what that was the impact in the comic book genre well um you know it was proof that marvel as a publisher was now a giant was now able to go out and get a licensed property and then handle it properly and do it with a certain class. And, you know, everyone had grown up with the, you know, the Marvel Universe and, you know, the Hulk and stuff like that. But suddenly here we are with Conan. And a lot of people, you know, obviously Conan had had a lot of history and a lot of people could be very nitpicky, you know, very judgmental, be like, oh, they're never going to do a good job. Uh, So in some respects, it was quite a risk when you think about it. you know, obviously, back in those days, who knew what the audience was? Were they going to better take this? Were they going to be brave enough to step out of that superhero universe and go into a different age, an age that wasn't created by Stan or Jack? And so there was a lot of unknowns. And, you know, now we can look back on it and say not only did that gamble pay off, uh, that run of Conan that Marvel uh, that did is basically the quintessential run and no matter who comes along afterwards, you always have to go back to this original classic era to get the Conan that everyone loves and adores. Beautifully said. Yeah, exactly. And beautiful. I, you, dude, look, look at tearing my eyes, Steve. Tearing my eyes. <laughs> That's an overstreet writer if I ever saw one. <laughs> so, Roy, just before we go into this, yeah. What what Presenting Conan to, to Stan Lee and to Marvel, did you guys think it was going to work? I have to say something first. If I if I seem a little stiff and I'm not moving around, it's because there's a big bright light behind me. And John said, "Keep your head in front of that light because if I move, <laughs> some people can blind it." So if I'm a little stiff, it's, it's I'm not to be dazzled. All that comes through is these is these gort like uh, rays from our eyes because if I I wear my lensless glasses. I can't see the book. Anyway, what was the question again? I think that, I think we've run over time. Anyway, we're talking Conan, Roy. Oh yeah, Conan. Right, I remember that. Yeah. So what about it? Well, I don't know. How did it come? How did it come in the mainstream? Well, basically, the uh, I'd been buying the stuff, but I hadn't been reading it. I just bought it for the Rosetta covers because I, uh, you know, 
I tried reading a few pages of it and I just didn't get it right away. It was just some barbarian running around, grabbing some princess, throwing her over his shoulder and taking off with her. And I was thinking it was going to be more like John Carter of Mars because it mentioned Atlantis on the back and stuff. And so I never gave it more than a few pages, but I kept buying the book for the Rosetta covers and even the one or two that weren't just to keep up the collection. But the readers by about 1968, 69, they were writing in telling us we should get the rights to not necessarily Conan, though some mentioned that. They said some sword and sorcery hero from the paperbacks. It's weird because they didn't suggest, you know, making up a character, although we could have done that. We, they didn't suggest Conan all the time specifically. Uh, some suggested just license a character, get somebody. And at the same time, they were, they we were getting a lot of other things uh, about do Edgar Rice Burroughs, Tolkien, Doc Savage, you know, we went after all those things, except for Tolkien ended up getting them all eventually, but DC had just take, taken over Burroughs and so forth, so we couldn't get that. But uh, so really what happened is that after all these letters, and by, and by this time I had started to read a little Sword and Sorcery. The first thing I read was Lynn Carter's book, Thongor and the City of Magicians, which has a great Frazetta cover, which I later owned for some years. And I then I started reading after that. That was good. That was half Conan, half John Carter, I felt. Then I... Then I went back and I started reading Howard and I very quickly discovered by in 68, 69, I suddenly discovered this was that I just, what I had missed before was that this guy was a really good writer at his best, that he told a really good story. He brought this world alive. And that once I got into it and gave it a little bit of a chance, uh, you know, I, I was sold on it. I knew he was, you know, far and away better than Lynn Carter or Gardner Fox or any of the people that were writing these, you know, pastiches imitating him. But still, when the people wrote in, Stan just got brought me into his office one day. So, you know, Stan was uh, the fountain of so much, you know, that was important at Marvel. Uh, and this one had nothing to do with Steve Ditko or Jack Kirby or, you know, uh, you know, although Kirby was still there. And uh, it was just Stan as the editor uh, saying, uh, you know, these letters, you know, maybe we should get something like that. And I said, yeah, well, maybe. But we're going to, I said, if they're saying get a licensed character, that means we're going to to pay a little something for it he says yeah you know and we had to have permission to do that you know so i so he empowered me and he asked me you know in quotes to write a you know a couple of page or so memo to martin goodman uh about why we should get one of these characters so i wrote this memo i said we have this strong hero uh you know there'll be uh, a, a lot of good looking women many of them not dressed for uh, arctic weather uh, there will be evil wizards and monsters. I didn't mention it had a medieval ancient look. I don't think that would have solely, although I didn't deny it, I just didn't mention it. So I and I said we should, you know, get a little money. So he authorized us, authorized uh, us. He loved this memo, Goodman. Two times when he saw me because he couldn't remember anything else about me, he would congratulate me on this old memo because that's all <laughs> I could remember about me. And uh, he authorized us to uh, to pay $150, which, of course, was more money than in 1969 than it is now. And so we went after Thongar because, for $150 a month, and Lynn Carter was happy to have Thongar adjusted, but his agent was not, and his agent kept stalling for like two, three, four months, thinking that Martin Goodman was going to up his offer. He had obviously never met Martin Goodman. You know, <laughs> Martin Goodman was not going to, you know, so I got finally frustrated, and finally when the Latest Conan book came out near the end of 69, the one called Conan the Sumerian. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the one with the Frost Giant's daughter story in it and, and that beautiful cover. For the first time, I noticed in the introduction by L. Sprague de Camp, I'd never bothered to reread them before. At the end of it, there was this thing telling me where the, the giving the address in Pasadena, Texas, of Glenn Lord, the quote, literary agent for the Robert E. Howard estate. Well, I didn't need a house to follow me to tell me that if you're looking for the rights to somebody, to a character, you go to the guy who's the literary agent for this guy's estate, right? So I didn't go to DeCamp or somebody. I went. I, I sent a letter off to Glenn Lard. I felt so embarrassed about the $150 that I actually offered him $200. He accepted, and then I was, then I was left with the dilemma: where do I get this extra 50 bucks back that I was not <laughs> authorized? So I thought I'd better write it. I, I don't think I would have written it otherwise. I might have given it to probably Jerry Conway. But uh, mm. I gave everything to Jerry that I didn't do back in those days, the monsters and everything. This would have probably been another one. 
But I, I, I thought, well, if I write it and Goodman wants that fifty dollars back, I can, you know, not vouch a couple of pages or so, whatever my rate was then, and uh, you know that'll make it come out even, so I can at least defend myself. And that's how I backed into writing hundreds and thousands of pages of Marvel and of coded with and movies and and the radio script and the newspaper strip, all because that lousy, you know, 50 bucks, you know, really. Otherwise, I probably never would have written it at all. And we have to mention in 1971 and 1974, <laughs> Conan the Barbarian won uh, uh, ongoing series of the year. Yeah. 1971, which we're going to get into the story that we... we uh, But this is 73, really. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, the... 20, one of these stories was actually story of the year. And in 77, 78, and 79, Conan, the Savage Sword of Conan was comic book uh, magazine of the year yeah. and stuff. Like I'm just saying. Yeah, so but what really counts is after the after a slow start of the first seven issues, in which each of the first seven issues sold less well than the one before, with number eight, and I won't go into the reason why because it has nothing to do with these issues, uh, with number eight and nine, the sales pick, which was, I have to say, uh, again, Stan saved our bacon on this and uh, uh, by making some, some suggestions about the covers, which he hadn't been paying as much attention to, although he always approved them. He just hadn't paid much attention. And his little suggestion make, made a difference. And, uh, and the next thing you know, we had a, a, you know, a modest hit. It wasn't a huge hit, but it was a modest hit. It was growing. It was selling better. Uh, it sold well through the rest of Barry's run. Barry left it for a couple of issues. Uh, intending it to be permanent. Gil Kane took over. The issues sold quite well, at least it was with Barry. And then uh, Barry came back. The sales continued to kind of climb. It was getting to be a, a pretty good book uh, in terms of sales. And uh, so we just, you know, we kept going. And, and what's funny, of course, is that for the first bunch of issues, from number one on through at least number, I don't know, eight, ten, something like that, they were all done with Barry living in England. You know, in fact, we plotted number seven in a in the lobby of uh, based on a Howard story, but we plotted it out in the lobby of a London hotel room where uh, G, my first wife, Judy, and I were staying with Barry. He was, but Barry was jumping around on the furniture the way Stan did. I never did that kind of stuff, you know. I, you know, but Barry, Barry was the one kind of scaring the other people in the room, <laughs> jumping around, doing sword stuff, you know. But and we, but and we, we we worked that out. We had a lot of fun. By this time, Barry was back in the states, so we would uh, talk things over, but. You know, it was still mostly by stories, but Barry, you know, always contributed uh, little bits here and there. And we'll talk about some of those as we go along. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to have Roy do a read through through um, issues Conan 23 and 24, yeah. which is uh, the first appearance of the Red Sonia. Yeah. Before we get into this, can you give a quick uh, a, a quick synopsis of the origin of Red Sonia? Well, the basic thing is Conan had had there were two women in Conan's life that uh, warrior types that were Belit, who he was going to meet sometime, you know, a year or something in the future, who was black haired she pirate. And later when he was like 40 or so, when he was king, there was a mention of Valeria or not before he was king, but a few years before he became king. Uh, there was a mention of Valeria in the story of Red Nails. She was a blonde. So I decided I wanted Conan to have not a regular partner, but somebody who could kind of come in and out of the magazines and, a woman warrior who kind of, you know, be like Valeria was uh, in the in that story in particular, uh, maybe even a better sword woman than Valeria because it never said she was totally exceptional. And I was and I said she'll be a redhead because, you know, we, we've had, had a black head. We had a yellow head. We'll have a, a redhead. And about that same time, I read an article from uh, by a guy named Alan Howard, no relation to Robert e. Howard, who mentions uh, what what were called. Uh, the uh, Crusader stories that Howard wrote. He wrote a bunch of stories set in or around the time of the Crusades. And one of the ones, which wasn't a Crusade story exactly, set in about the 14th or 15th century during the Siege of Vienna by the Turks, was called The Shadow of the Vulture. And it had a, so there was a German guy in it who could be turned into Conan. And there was a red-haired woman named Red Sonia with a Y. Now, the funny thing is, when I read the article by this guy, it just said there was a Russian she-cat, a red-headed Russian she-cat in the story who might have made a good match for Conan. In fact, she might have been too much for him. That's very close to what the guy said. That was it. No mention of the name, no 
no details, no nothing. But I said, this sounds good. So I got Glenn Lard to send me a copy of the story, which had been printed in 1935, but had not been reprinted in a magazine about crusade and historical fiction, that kind of thing. Uh, Golden Fleece or Magic Carpet. It had both names at different times. And I saw the story. I said, Reg Sonia, that's not only an interesting character. It's a good name. And I changed the spelling from a Y to a J. So it would be, so the Marvel character, the Conan age character would be Red Sonia with a J, even pronounced the same. And it wouldn't be quite the same character as in the other book. And, and I just adapted, uh, Barry and I adapted Shadow of the Vulture into issue number 23. It was supposed to be 22, but we had some scheduling problems and 22 had to be a reprint of the first issue with a, the cover that should have gone with that. Funny thing is we had two, we had uh, those two covers for Shadow of the Vulture and Sonia's not on either one of them. I didn't have enough, somehow Barry and I, never thought to put red sonia on the cover of the magazine introduced her it shows we we weren't necessarily thinking of her as super as a superstar or anything like that and so we did that and then uh you know then so we adapted that story i, I wish we had made it two it was long enough we should have made it two stories probably but we were squeezing it into about 20 pages we could have done a better job in two and then when that was done i went ahead with the the story i had already outlined in my mind which was why red sonia had come to this be so besieged city what she's after and how she gets it. And, uh, you know, and so and Barry executed that very beautifully. And uh, we were off and running, but we, but I deliberately wanted to write Red Sonia out at the end of that second story because I didn't want people to suddenly think they're a team like Batman and Robin or Catman and Kitten or something like that. You know, I, as she'd come back, you know, six months, a year later, she might run into Conan again, but I didn't want her to become like a steady character in the book. And uh, and that's what we're gonna be doing. So, uh, Niall, can you put up the cover? Yeah, since Barry had done this preceding cover, you didn't have which was a sort of a scene uh, from that story. Uh, I don't know if Barry just didn't want to do a second cover. I have this vague idea that he thought he had already done a cover and didn't want to do another one. So, uh, or maybe there wasn't time. I can't recall. So we got Gil Kane. Uh, I don't remember who inked this, but, uh, but uh, anyway, Gil Kane pencils other character. Again, we have the Vulture character there, but no Red Sonia. So, and, and there's even you know a couple of word balloons, which we didn't have that often on Conan covers. We just, I felt somehow that word balloons went better with uh, Gil Kane covers than they did with Barry Smith covers, maybe. Okay. And by the way, I won't be calling him Barry Windsor Smith because I never worked with anybody on Conan, you know, called Barry Windsor Smith. <laughs> although I, there's nothing wrong with that name. <laughs> Barry Smith, the Windsor came after he left Conan. So, you know, I think it was Barry Smith and no, no disrespect. I, that's just the person I knew. Okay. So, all right, Niall, turn the page, please. All right. Roy. Okay. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's the, uh, I can see enough of that to know. It's, it's just getting him into this last, this city called Macalad. I think that's some kind of word that's from uh, Dune, Frank Herbert's book, Dune. I think there's a place called Macalad or something close to it. Or maybe it's from the word immaculate, you know, immaculate conception. Maybe I took it from that. What, and I gave it a kind of an Arabic Arabic sound. And and so he's just comes charging in. There's a beautiful, uh, you know, splash page there by uh, Barry. Is that Dan Adkins inking? I think it is. Yes. Probably. Yes. Yep. Adkins. Dan Adkins. Yeah. Well, he, uh, no, yeah, no, Sal Bissima started it. And then Adkins and Chick Stone even inked a few pages of it. So it actually had three different inkers. We were... We were trying to catch up from this reprint. I guess we were having some scheduling problems at that time, you know, and so forth. I don't recall what they were, though. Okay, next page. Anyway, so we just got into it. I'll, I'll skip over a lot of this simply because to get the, the Conan stuff. Uh, basically, you know, Conan just gets in there and he... Uh, basically, what happened is he was on the other side. He was with uh, Prince Yezdegerd, who's besieging the city of Macalette. But he didn't like Yezdegerd. In fact, he gave him a scar right across his face. And he so he and they swam into uh, the city of uh, Maclet, uh and uh, no, it's Padishah. That's the thing comes from too. Anyway, so he swims in there and he sort of volunteers his service to the other side, kind of rather brazenly, you know, because they could very well easily have uh, killed him since you know he just invaded their city, coming from the other side. But you know, Conan just figured, well, I, I was helping them. Now I'm here to help you, and, and so forth. And they decided, well, hey, maybe maybe anybody that brazen should get a chance. Next page now. So, I don't know, just just more of that stuff. Let's skip this. That's just him getting in good with the king, you know, getting his permission to do something or other. And the king sends him on some kind of uh, mission. Yeah, next page. Yeah, the 
King sends him on a mission. I don't remember what it was, whatever Robert E. Howard had. We probably altered it. So he goes in. I want to get back to the other stuff later. Yeah, so, so we skip that one. Okay. Now, then we get to the next page. If maybe. Yeah. This is weird because there's no Barry Smith in this page at all. Uh, for some reason, I, I don't remember if we were page short. Maybe the story is a page long. But anyway, uh, when you get to the next page, you will see the first page of the next page is the the first one that Barry drew of the shadow of, of, of the vulture character, but it, it wasn't a very dramatic uh, shot, just kind of a medium shot and so forth. It didn't have any drama to it. So I did something that I very rarely did. I actually wrote a page in advance. I wrote out a script for Sal Buscema, who was the inker, but who of course could also pencil very well. So I wrote out this uh, six panel page, you know, where the, with the dialogue and everything and sent it off to Sal and said, put this in. I want this to be, you know, the next page and come before the other and so forth. So, uh, and I thought that was a kind of a nice page. It, nobody seemed to notice, you know, he, I didn't tell him I he had to imitate Barry, but you know, he came close enough in that, in that day and age to uh, what Barry was doing at that time. It wasn't quite as detailed, but this wasn't that kind of panel anyway. It's all set at night. Okay. Next page now. Yeah. Yeah. You can see up there that first panel, you know, you see a, uh, a couple, of shots there and the vulture is just talking to somebody i thought that was a rather weak way to introduce the vulture our big villain that's why i put it in the other page other mm. than that he's just there to uh he's there uh, uh, with prince yesdegur who's the heir apparent of of taran the big kingdom that's trying to take over the eastern world at the time prince yesdegur doesn't hate conan you know conan hurt him but he doesn't even think about conan being the city he just wants but but he but if he does run into Conan, he's he wants him to you know take his head you know and everything. So uh, <laughs> anyway, and there's a line which which is from Howard. Um, he says that uh, where the, the uh, shadow says uh, the vulture says, uh, "If I bring you not his head, I give him leave to send you mine." Sometimes people shouldn't make prophecies like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so next then page we get now. to the next page, and. Uh, uh, let's see here. I don't know. Let's. I don't know. Just a bunch of fighting around. Go to the next page. Yeah, Conan. In the meanwhile, is uh, gets distracted by a wench. He's supposed to be doing something or other for the king, but you know, there's always time for uh, a wench. So there he is. <laughs> and about this time, Conan had, start, Conan had started off because we felt maybe a costume of sorts might be good for the Marvel readers, and Conan didn't have one. So Barry. Had, had given him this horned helmet that he had originally done for that character Star the Slayer in the one-shot story we did. And he also gave Conan this kind of medallion. Looks like three gigantic poker chips hanging around his neck with this little, these symbols on it. But it was really a nice uh, little medallion of three pieces there. Well, in issue number six, Barry had decided to get rid of the uh, helmet, which was fine by that time. I thought it was established well enough. So when he wrote that scene, I thought that was just great. So in this one, he decides to get rid of the medallion. I said, well, okay, we don't need that either. If Barry wants to get rid of the medallion and not draw it anymore, it's okay. We don't need it. If we didn't need the helmet, we sure don't need the medallion. So he gives the medallion to this girl. I think it's killed on the next page anyway, but that just makes it matter. But anyway, we, this is just our way of getting rid of some of the little accoutrements of uh, of Conan. Oh, wow. And, and so forth. You know, uh, And then we go on to the next page where there is an attack. And we bring the vulture into the thing here at finally, right? And uh, the vulture, I think, I think they kill that girl. The girl gets killed in the raid. That just makes uh, Conan, you know, really hate the vulture, even though he probably he barely knew the girl's name. But the fact remains, you know, she was with him and she was killed. So anyway, we go past that because I, uh, you know, so uh, next page you now. Yeah. Then we go. Okay. So this is conan fighting away okay we'll, we'll skip that page go on to the next one now we get to the next page this is the way i wanted to get to here as he as he's trying to get into the uh into the town and he says open the damn door you know i can't come in here they do that and but not only do they open the door but someone rides out and and uh, one of the people who rides out is this woman red sonia that's how she's introduced i think that's pretty close to the way that uh the night in uh in the 14th, 15th century story uh, that uh, Howard wrote uh, was a, a German named von Kalmbach uh, and so forth. And and uh, so in there, Sonia's coming out to rescue him. But in this case, she's coming out to rescue 
Conan. So there she is. And that's her introduction. Now, Barry gave her an outfit. I didn't like that much, but, you know, he, he was designing the character. It was okay. Uh, this chainmail shirt's kind of nice, but he, he also put her in one of... There was a thing going around in New York and cities. I don't know how nationwide it was. They were called hot pants. You know, they took that naughty little expression and turned them into these real short shorts that women were wearing. I think 70s. Steve still wears those. Yeah, yeah Steve still know. wears those. When he squats. Anyway, uh, so, but, you know, it was okay. I, I liked the male shirt. I didn't care much for the short pants because it didn't look like something out of the uh, Hyborian age to me. But I left them in there. Of course, you may have noticed that the next time Sonia appeared after the first time Barry didn't draw the story, I changed her outfit. I didn't like that. It was a nice enough costume, but I didn't really care that much for it. Anyway, so Sonia's been introduced there. Not a big full shot, maybe like it could have been. That's an example of the fact that we'd have been able to do a better job if we had put into two two issues. But I didn't have enough sense to have us do that. Okay, next page now. So now we see uh, Sonia you know, just fighting away. And uh, we, we, could, we see that she's quite a fighter and so forth. So again, you know, we could have done so much more if we had spread the story out a little bit, as it is, Barry was a little bit pushed for time. But he does a good job of, of giving her some, uh, of having, showing that she's, that she's not just there, you know, she's not just Joan of Arc leading soldiers without fighting. She's a fighter. And then on the next page, you know, he's kind of introduced to her and you begin to, you begin to get the, the uh, the start of the relationship between Conan and, and Sonia. And, you know, and as you kind of have, they're both kind of warriors. There's, on the one hand, because it's Conan, there has to be whatever Sonia thinks, there's got to be a certain sexual tension, at least on Conan's part, because <laughs> he never met a good looking woman and not too many ugly ones that he didn't want to go to bed with. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but but she obviously is not interested in that kind of thing, particularly. So there's, you've set up that that tension already. Some of that, I think, was, in, again, in the uh, original story. Probably most of it was. Uh, and then there's then there's something that uh, Barry did that I really hated, but I let it go just because I was afraid he'd cry if I if I kicked it out. It, it seemed to mean something to him. He has Conan kick a dog that's barking at him. Oh, yeah. You I guess it's supposed to be frustration from Sonya. I thought it, I didn't think it made look Conan good, made Conan look good. And if it had been for the fact that I didn't want to... Uh, Press Barry on, and he didn't really hurt the dog. I, I, I didn't, I didn't like it. It's just one of those things that I, I thought was a false step. I don't think, you know, I never heard of Conan kicking a dog in, uh, in any of Howard's stories. I didn't like it here, but I, I let it go. You know, we all humor the artists sometimes. They do something we don't like, but we say they do so many things we do like that if they want to do something else sometime, I would try to write it just in order to not annoy them. That was one of the differences between Stan and me. If Stan saw something they didn't think was quite right. He had he never had any compunction about just making it change, just erase it, get somebody to draw something else, whether it was Jack or Ramita or whoever it might be. I would I think I I would tend to think more about is this going to piss the artist off if I if I take out this dog and take out his little kicking the dog scene? Is it going to mean more to him than it means to me? So I left the dog in. But every time I ever see it, I think I should have taken it out. Maybe Stan's right. Oh, wow. Anyway. And. uh there you just, you know, it just gets into, uh, I don't know, more skullduggery here. Next page now? Yeah. Because the uh, the Vultures people are going to, you know, sneak in here to uh, to try to uh, capture. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is the page. Yeah, this is the page in which he kicks the dog. The, bar the dog is barking at him on the preceding page. This is the page where he kicks the dog. Uh, you know, would love to erase that or, ha or have Conan miss and fall flat on his ass. So that would have been funny. Anyway, so then we get to... Uh, Next page now? Yeah. And so they're setting a trap for Conan. And uh, in the meantime, in the middle of this fight, you know, everybody is attacking the city. And uh, let's go on to the next page. I want to get through most of this to get to Sonya again. Yeah, there's not too, uh, too much on this page, just getting closer. But basically what they do is they... They lure Conan into a place so they can capture him. This whole thing has been a thing to just mainly to capture Conan. Next page. And then uh, th then you have a really nice Nick, yeah. nice entrance by Sonia. She comes right in. Again, this is straight from uh, Shadow of the Vulture by Robert E. Howard, where uh, Kalmbach, the German knight, gets himself in a bad situation, and Sonia comes in. The only difference is, in, of course, in that time, she could also have had a pistol. 
a one shot pistol because that was the it was the gunpowder age and the uh, the Howard story rather later than the uh, usual crusade story. And there were a couple of gunshots going off. Of course, we just cut all that out. So uh, next page now. Okay, so while she's doing that, uh, even though she's an interesting character, she still is, as she was in Howard's story, a, a supporting character in the story. So the main thing is Conan closing in with the uh, the Vulture character. Okay. Next and, page now. Yeah, and then and then uh, finally we have the uh, the real confrontation and that's that's really nicely done i think it all very paced that very well has a very big panel where you suddenly see conan in the doorway and then you have the smaller shots and then it goes to an all black panel oh yeah yeah you know? i see it. and i think i took that uh that line from uh, from that that uh, this poem that howard had written evidently before the conan stories very illustrated once that that poem called samaria and the last thing about it, he says, I was born in Samaria, a land of darkness and deep night. So that's really a quote from a, a line of uh, Howard uh, poetry oh. and everything. It just it doesn't rhyme, but it's poetry. <laughs> Next page. Um, OK, so then you get to the two page ending. The Sonia is done with the story, but it's kind of nice. You got the, you know, Prince Yezdegerd is uh, kind of, you know, sitting in his, uh, in his tents, you know, outside the city in the siege and so forth. And then in the last page. Uh, he he gets a he gets a little present there. Uh, he gets a uh, somebody brings this little treasure uh, chest looking thing to him, and he opens it up. We don't see what he says, but then of course uh, at the bottom of the page we can figure it out because uh, it, it, it reminds the, the the vultures quote if I bring not if I bring you not his head I give him leave to send you mine. So oh yeah now yeah. we couldn't have shown it if we wanted to because the the common code would have gone eight you know we tried to show we had to be heading a few issues earlier we had to do that too uh, but in this case we just suggested it that's really nice you don't need to see the head you know that it's in there yeah you know? i think that's, that's great even in the prose they didn't describe the head it's just you know he opens the thing and he sees it and then he, th he thinks what the guy said anyway so that was the story and even though it was kind of low-key and sonia isn't really in the story that much but it kind of introduced her and once she was in there that i thought well i want there was you know, why was she there? She had never been sent there from another city. I think uh, Hadashah, that was the one that really came from Dune, I think. And uh, so then we get to issue number 24, which would have been 23 if uh, we hadn't had the fill in there. Here you have, uh, it became Barry's last ever issue of the Color Conan. Uh, I don't, I think we kind of knew that at the time. I think we knew that he was going to quit again the second time. Um, and, uh, in fact, that was the time that Stan called me in, to, and he got a little concerned because the book was picking up. It wasn't like super selling. It was selling quite well now. It had slowly grown. It had been selling under Gill those couple issues. It had been picking up a little more again when Barry came back. We were doing really well. And he called me in a little worried. He says, says Roy, says, i got to ask you about Conan. He says, yeah, what about it? says, well, Barry's quitting after this issue. He says, yeah, what? What do you think? He says, well, what do you think will happen to Conan when Barry leaves? I says, I think we'll win fewer awards and sell more copies. And I love Barry's work. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I knew that next up in the line was going to be John DeSima, you know, our first choice. And as much as I like Barry, I figured that John would sell the book even better than Barry did. Barry could have gone on doing the book forever as far as I was concerned. But I had a feeling that John and I could do it even better. So I said that to Stan. And Stan kind of looked at me a little unbelievably. But within a few months, which proved right. And within a year or two, you know, Conan was one of the very top selling books on the line so we were kind of pleased but it might have done that with Barry too Barry was certainly a great artist uh, anyway so this is this beautiful drawing that Barry penciled and inked for the cover it's uh, nicely colored I don't mean, you know it's so that it really focuses them out the rest of the characters are you know colored like in one co one or two colors to pop them out and it really works very well it's a beautiful cover okay now now Barry's uh, the, the, the story was you know pretty much basically mine had kind of been in place but Barry added a really one really nice touch to the story. I just said that they're in a bar. You know, they're drinking in a bar or whatever it is, Conan and Sonia and so forth, and there's going to be a bar fight in a minute, and that was it. Barry had this idea, which you know, had never occurred to me, but I think it was a great one, that, that she should dance. You know, there was never anything in Howard's original story, Shadow of the Vulture, that indicated that she would do something like that. But, you know, she was 
a woman, a, a woman or a man can just decide they want to dance and she would look great dancing. So when this came, so Barry just decided to draw that. And the first I saw of it was uh, when the page came in. I thought that was great. Now, if we'd started the story some other way, it would still have been a great story. But you got to admit, that's a hell of a splash page. Yeah. You know, it, it looked yeah. really great. Which is, you know, dancing and in, in, in front of people. And it was kind of nice because my theory about Sonia and her, you know, being yet living in a male world, but, you know, and, and, and wearing that kind of clothes was that there was a side of her that really kind of, I don't know, did, she didn't really like men that much. She kind of liked the idea of kind of tempting them by showing a certain amount of flesh and curvature. And then, you know, you can look, you can't touch. I spelled that out the next time she picked up with, uh, when she came back with, uh, with the Busima thing, I, I spelled it out. But here I, it, it just fit. Barry had sensed I said the same thing and caught it just perfectly. It's just really a wonderful splash page. I think Barry colored this issue too. I think he, he, uh, they had been colored, by, uh, many of them had been, one or two he colored. Most of them had been colored by uh, Mimi Gold, who, uh, around, who around that time had sort of been his girlfriend that, that everything. She had done a lot of work when she was here to get him back from England, from the exile he'd been sent into by the customs people. And uh, they went together for, you know, maybe a year or so. And she was doing a lot of the coloring and did a great job on it. But Barry decided he wanted to color this last one himself. So there's even a few other little touches. I think there's that, isn't there sort of a white glow on Conan's chest? Like he's flesh, but then the, the part of it's white, like an extra glow and so forth. Yes. I think Barry was just trying out a few things on there and i think you know, he did some experimental coloring here and there so very nice and the song of red sonia you know with a little bit of spiked uh, howard uh uh poetry even though the word hades is in it which is not part of the hyborian age i thought it'd be kind of nice to have this uh tarantella dance of his in there okay next page okay. now yeah so now okay so now we uh let's see here oh yeah well of course if sonia's going to dance and you know again Barry, you know, probably just you know tossed this in. I, I, or I could we could it could have been you know that. I mean, I think we both knew that what needed to happen was some some guy come on to Sonia. We'd never seen that, right? You know, not not Conan, but some other guy, and to find out what was going to happen to him. And uh, so on the second page, we do, you know, I mean, uh, you know, it, because he's kind of pawing at her and. Uh, while, you know, amazingly, she doesn't hit him right away, but it starts a bar fight. You can't have too many bar fights in the Conan comics, you know. <laughs> Next page, enough. Okay, well, then I, uh, yeah, here, this is a, a weird page. This is kind of funny. We had another one of those silent panels that were very rare at Marvel in panel two. But it's not silent. There's the other thing there. But, you know, we usually had sound effects and things, and I had decided and didn't tell Stan, and he didn't know this until about this time, that there would be no non-verbal sound effects in a Conan comic. I just didn't think they fit there. They, they, were, they worked very well in Spider-Man or most of the other books, although Steve Ditko kept Stan to keep them out to some extent. So, but I, I wanted to not have any non-verbal. I'd have an arg from an animal or something, but I didn't want any smash, crash, pop kind of thing. And... Uh, so anyway, that was kind of funny. This was a scene like, you know, from any number of places. Conan's a big guy. But one of the things that Howard never did in any story was to ever have another human being who was bigger than Conan. He had monsters who were bigger than Conan, but Conan never ran into anybody who was bigger than he is. In the comic here, though, he does here. So, you know, so he hits somebody with a chair and... Uh, it reminded me a little bit. There's a scene in Elvis's 1968 uh, comeback specials like that, but I don't say Barry or I got that from there. Anyway, so but the weird the weirdest thing that happened was was kind of unpleasant at the time was in panel four. Barry knew I was going to write all the dialogue for this, you know, and so forth. And you know, sometimes he wrote little suggestions in the things in the margins. Some and sometimes I followed. Sometimes I didn't. But he said he'd really like me to use the word wank in this one to call somebody a wank. And I, I'm a suspicious guy by nature. And I said, uh, Barry, I said, I will, but does that mean anything in England? It doesn't, you know, mean anything. <laughs> he says, he guaranteed me that it did not, it did not, it wasn't a dirty word. It wouldn't get us in trouble with the comics code or with anybody else. And he promised me. And of course, it does mean something dirty. Everybody kind of knows that. A lot of people in America know it now. Not everybody, but a lot of people. But I guarantee you, none of us around the office and I don't even remember getting any letters particularly. We did not many. 
uh, about it in 1973. All, all I know is that I learned quickly from somebody, at least one person, in the next, as soon as it was published, and it was too late to do anything about it, I learned that wank was a dirty word. <laughs> and as I told Barry, I think at the time, uh, you know, from now on, if you tell me it's raining outside, I'm going to go to the window and stick my hand out. You know, <laughs> I would never have taken Barry's word for anything because he lied to me on that. And he could have got us in trouble. The code would have been, might have been very upset. Yeah. Somebody might have come in. We're trying to get dirty stuff. The weird thing, though, is that they've reprinted the story a whole mess of times. They've never changed it anyway, you know, and so forth, uh, even when the code was still going. So I, I guess we uh, we didn't corrupt too many people, but it it, it made me very angry. I, Barry was leaving, so this was just his way of showing his contempt for us lesser mortals, you know, that, that he could get away with everything and embarrass us or cause us. He didn't care if I got in trouble with Stan or the code or whatever, because he was quitting anyway. It's one of the reasons why Barry and I got really well along well for 24 issues of Conan and not very well after that. You know? yeah. But anyway... Uh, after that, it just goes back to the fight, you know. But it's all beautiful work. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't fault Barry's artwork or storytelling, you know, to. Uh, okay, next page world. now. Okay, well, let's see here. It's just the end of the fight. Uh, let's see. What does what does Sonia do in this fight? Does she do that much? Yeah, it looks like she's, she's doing a little something, but I don't remember seeing her do a lot of the fighting. She does, she's great on the cover. She's doing a little something on the preceding page. Uh, probably we should have done maybe a little more with her fighting. I would have liked to have seen her fighting a little more, but of course Conan is the hero, and we, it worked out pretty well anyway. Uh, but um, so the fight's over, and Conan and uh, Sonia stomp off. Next page. And yeah, uh, here we get into something else that uh, you know Barry probably tossed in on his own. I don't, don't remember exactly, but they're walking along, and all of a sudden they just decide to. Uh, you know, jump into a fountain, cool off, I guess, after the fight. And, uh, you know, and again, really nice silent panels of the kind that Mar Stan did not like, silent panels. You remember there was that story when, when, when Starenko uh, did a silent panel and one of his first S.H.I.E.L.D. story, Saul Brodsky tried to not to get him to not take any pay for it because he didn't write any dialogue on the page. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I think Stan put him up to it, you know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, so they jump in, and that changes to the next page, which was the interesting one. Next page. Yeah, then. Barry, this is not, the other page has been printed. There, the, the, In the original version of this, of this, uh, there was no indication in, uh, I forget exactly how, it, how she was positioned. There was no indication in those first couple of panels that she's holding anything, holding that shirt that high between herself you know, her nude upper half, Conan, you know. And and also in the third panel, Conan's hands are disappearing beneath the water. We don't see his hands are out of waist. The hands are disappearing beneath the water and obviously have his he has his hands on some other part of her anatomy than around her waist. And then in the uh, the next couple of panels, she kind of fishes them off. Well, the comics code, I don't know why, they're just sensitive that way, I guess. They didn't like that page very much. <laughs> so we had to suddenly... You know, redo it. I, I guess Barry redid it. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not sure that's those are his hands around uh, Sonia and panel three. I, you know, we would have had him do the corrections and everything, but if he wasn't there, they'd have had to be done anyway. We didn't have time to uh, to wait. So anyway, that, that was kind of interesting. But that, that, the, 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 the nice thing is because we had sent the page to the code, you know, very late and it was and it had already been uh, uh, photostat. And everything. The original page also existed, so that's been reprinted in the black and white and in other, even other. In the colors. Marvel Treasury. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and probably even in color by now, you know, and so forth. So there are two versions of the page. There's the PG-rated version, or the P, and, and then there's the. It's still not that bad. It's the, it's more like a PG-13 kind of page in today's society, I suppose. But it was pretty spicy for the comics at that time. Uh, the reason we got away with this much, because she is, after all, she's obviously uh, you know, taken off her male shirt and has nothing underneath it. Uh, but Leonard Darwin, the uh, head of the Comics Code for about 65, 66 on for many years, who was a, a lawyer, very nice guy. We got along real well. But he, he told me once, he said, you know, I let a lot of things go by in Conan that I won't let go by in other comics, mostly, or very few of them, because I figure you probably have a... Uh, an older readership 
Of course, we weren't going for an older readership. We were going for exactly, we wanted every six and seven year old that read Spider-Man to pick up Conan if they could, as well as the 15s and the 20s and the 30s and so forth. But I wasn't gonna disillusion Glenn if he wanted to think that we were going for an older audience and we didn't want any eight year olds to be seeing this this particular prurient work. Well, I, I didn't want to disabuse him of that notion. So I just let him go. And so we got away with, uh, you know, some things anyway. Okay. Next page now. Okay. Well, let's see then. I'm trying to think what it is. Just, it's just, it's just, just nice touches. Barry uh, has, uh, especially in that lower left panel. I, I like the way Sonia's kind of, she's got those gourds or whatever, and she's kind of sh shaking them and waving them to somebody back there. You know, uh, that was the thing about Barry, along with the fact that he told a, a good story and a, a powerful story. He also did all these the little touches. He, he tossed it a lot of uh, little touches that, uh, you know, they weren't all just kicking dogs. Some of them were, you know, were really nice, nice things, you know. And uh, then, of course, they're, you know, they're going into this to this city and so forth. Okay, Next page now. Yeah. I have to tell you, there's a there's a page in between, which is nothing but. Uh, this wizard, one of the the wizard of the uh, the city there, uh, it's it, well they he um, he's just sitting there buried in this thing which he had done a few issues earlier. He just tossed a page in that, and and with a lot of room for me to write not the usual dialogue and captions, but he sort of he was sort of encouraged me. I wouldn't have had to do it. But he was encouraging me to, uh, you know, just maybe just write prose on this page. So I, so I said, yeah, why not? Neil used to do the same thing, you know, with uh, X Men and so forth. Write Pretty Roy and all that kind of thing. So Barry left his pages blank. I do have a couple of balloons in one panel, but otherwise it's sort of like prose. I I lettered this upper and lower class, uh, upper and lowercase prose, and uh, I just thought, well, that, that made it a little different from the usual comic book page. You didn't find a page of straight prose and Fantastic Four Spider-Man. So it was just another way of saying, you know, on, on both Barry's and my account that uh, Conan was a little different from your usual comic book. All right, next page. Now. Yeah, then we go. Uh, I And I was really proud of this. this is something that, uh, you know, uh, Barry and I did talk over. I'm pretty sure I wanted this really phallic tower. I don't know if you noticed that. You may have overlooked the fact this is a very phallic tower here on the page. It's set up uh, you know, for a, to pay off at a later scene, but it's very dominant there. So anyway, uh, so Conan tries to, in the meantime, uh, inspired by the phallic power, Conan tries to come on to Red Sonia, you know, probably wouldn't have occurred to him otherwise, but anyway, so, and she, uh, she slams him down and so forth, and, you know, and uh, I just wanted to keep up that, you know, we wanted to keep up that sexual tension between the two of them, because Conan, at this stage of his life, you know, maybe later he can think of Red Sonia only as a comrade. But at this stage, she's still, you know, a nice-looking woman. And, okay, so she can fight a little bit, but that just makes him wonder all the more. Did you inspire Walt Disney a little bit here or the vice versa? I you know, they do that all the time, yeah, too. Probably done that too. Yeah. Well, sometimes it's just a tower. is just a tower. But in this case, it was there on purpose. Anyway, okay, the next, next page, page now. The next page, we got to the, the thing that I had – that I had uh, considered would be the the reason Sonia was there. She's there to swipe this uh, this talisman that was taken from her kingdom, the city she came from. He sent her there to get it back. And uh, so, but, but here you have some beautiful stuff. Look, I mean, look at that panel at the upper right, that nice face and all the the hair. I mean, I know that sometimes people say, "Oh, well, Barry, you know, he just." He just drew so much it looked like a lot like it was good just because he drew a lot of it but that hair has character you know what i mean it isn't just a bunch of string, stringy lines that that hair is really kind of expressive color it, it's kind of wild you know and i so think forth. that red sonia face is and beautiful. the red sonia face is very Fantastic. nice too yeah i mean uh let's see did barry ink this one too I did, I, i'm trying to remember offhand uh yeah yeah he inked it too i thought he did this this final one it's not as delicate as his later inking on it, but he was, uh, but he was inking it all, and it's just just beautiful stuff. All the nice angles, and you know, you, you you're looking in the lower left, you're looking down at kind of a dizzying angle past Conan. I mean, those are nice uh, cinematic shots that, that he did. Probably much better, say, than when he was doing a similar climbing tower, say, back in say 
number four, Tower of the Elephant. You know, it's it's even, you know, it's just he's improved as an artist. He's grown as an artist in that time. Next page now. And the next page is, and there's this beautiful panel in the middle when they get there. This is this whole jewel. There's jewels and tapestries and coins and everything else. Uh, reminds me of that scene, remember in issue number eight where uh, Barry had all these coins on the floor. And if you read real closely, it says, I must be mad to sit here drawing all these coins or whatever it said. It's, you could, you could, it, and you could sort of read that, but then we let it go anyway, because what the heck, you know? And uh, anyway, but this is just beautiful. He's, he's, he's established this. You need one panel to kind of set up that place and show that there's all this stuff around. To Conan, you know, he's he's just after anything. You know, he, he, it's all gold. It's all good to him. But she's after one particular thing. And you can see that while he's going kind of nuts there, she's he's just uh, looking at her. And again, there's a really, I think that's a really a nice face of, you, you mentioned the one on the preceding page. I think the one at the bottom yeah, right beautiful. is the one that's really good. I mean, it's really has character. She's just not she's not just another pretty face. Next page now. The next page is, of course, I had to put uh, some caps in there to kind of explain almost like a voiceover why she was there in uh, in this in Macalette. You know what she came for, what she's looking for, and she finds it. You know, and she finds that it's and it's this, uh, serpent. you know, this yeah, this serpent uh, gleaming, you know, made out of uh, precious metals and so forth. So she takes off with it because you know all she's been doing. She didn't care about Conan really. She didn't care about all the other gold. She's there on a mission for her king, and she uh, so she does it. She takes this thing and she runs off. And then at the bottom of the page is a nice setup. You suddenly you know Conan hears her screaming. Next page now. And at that point, I hope you didn't stay. Say, oh, good. You came got this page. Yay. This is another page like the other one. Barry left another one where, except for one uh, balloon, there's no dialogue. It's, it's all, it, it's not written like regular captions. It's a little more like straight prose. And again, he just left such a blank space and uh, suggested I fill it with regular prose. And I thought, well, that's a nice challenge. So I did that. And, uh, Oh, the the weird thing about this is at this particular time, I was going through uh, a very unhappy separation with my first wife, and I was dating another young woman who worked in in the office that I had read that I hadn't known before, and and we were going together, and that was pretty nice. And she got a little upset when she saw this because there's there's something in the writing of this page that made her see right away that. that I was thinking about my first wife, I think, <laughs> you know, about Gina wow. and so forth. I guess it just kind of came through and so forth. And she 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 could tell that. She wasn't angry, but she just she recognized it. And uh, you know, you can't keep yourself out of your work, no matter how hard hmm. you try. In this bigger case, this kind of tender scene led to it. Next page. Now. Anyway, so then we got to the the funny thing is that one quiet page interrupts the whole time that that's happening. Conan is running to her toward that voice. It could have just been the very next page, and Barry, but Barry had tossed that other page in there, so we had a little delay. And then you, uh, you look at the next page, and this this is a beautiful, beautiful full page shot. You know, obviously that talisman is turning into a real live reptilian monster, and uh, she's saying these words, uh, "Kanama Kalajarama," and. The interesting thing is we'd already used that in a couple of comics before because that's that's I took that from uh, King Cull in the which we had adapted the uh, the very first King Cull story which was called uh, the Shadow Kingdom uh, the way that Cull was told that he could negate the language of, of these serpent men and make them show themselves they were men with the heads of serpents they were these aliens that were trying to take over the kingdom is if he said those words, it drove them nuts. They couldn't repeat it because they, I don't know, they couldn't get their sibilant tongues around it or something. And and it just drove them crazy. And, and uh, it was kind of a, you know, a, a, a talismanic word against them. So I so I worked this old thing to kind of tie the call and the Conan stories, you know, kind of together to make it all part of one, you know, continuity. Oh, wow. And it's just a beautiful shot there. Nice. Next okay. page now? Next page is, well, it's, it's just a fight page, but of course it's done. Beautifully. Barry had some interesting snakes in some of these various issues. You know, we had a Gila monster, which isn't a snake, but a reptile in one story. We had these, uh, the man-headed snake in another story. And here we have a snake that's actually, you know, made of precious jewels kind of come to life. 
So, uh, and again, you know, beautiful shots like that, that one at the middle of the bottom row where, you know, it's like it's coming right at Cohen and he's smashing away at it. And again, you said Barry has not made it easy for himself. He's drawn every scale of that damn mistake, you know, every, every precious gold, piece. you know, piece. And it's just, uh, you know, he, he never stints. He never, uh, you know, it's easy to see why at the stage he was feeling that no matter what he did, he was never going to be able to make any money, you know, doing Conan because he had to put too much work in on it. You know, uh, and of course, in this case, he's also linking it, but he was putting so much and, you know, oh, Marvel would have an upper limit. They could give him raises, but you, they couldn't pay him more than they were, they, or even as much as they were paying, say, a, a Jack Kirby or, you know, Jack Kirby wasn't uh, there at that stage anymore, but, you know, or John Buscemi. They couldn't necessarily, because the book wasn't selling quite. Well, they were giving him raises, but they, but Stan couldn't, you know, pay him maybe what. I don't even know if paying the top rate, you know, would have been enough, you know, for Barry at this stage. So unfortunately, at some stage, he was kind of, you know, basically like Boris Vallejo did later on the covers of Savage Sword, kind of pricing himself out of our market by saying that, you know, he needed to go on to, to oh. something else. And so then we had last chapter, which is the climax of the fight, and so forth and and uh, ends with a nice smashing there by cohen at the end we give some sonia who of course betrayed him before but uh, now she comes back to his age she's she you know she didn't want anything bad to happen to conan she was just wanted to leave him and run off with the jewels but uh she comes back to help him which uh, shows that she's not just a, a mercenary character wait hold on now yeah, next well, page yeah then the next page yeah wait wait that yeah that one right there this one here okay now the next page now yeah, now the next page. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's some more, just you know, more fighting. I, I I really don't know what else I can really say about it. Again, you know, every hair on Conan's head, every hair on Red Sonia's head, and yet the focus is on the faces and the action and the emotions. And the other stuff is makes it look real, but you know, it's 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 uh, it's not just a time waster, it just makes things look a little more real. Okay, next page now. And uh and here you have uh, a nice tall panel panel where you know snake right rears up for the final thing bangs conan against the wall in fact and so forth and finally everything collapsed and uh i guess the kanama kalajarama stuff finally got to the snake and he's finally turning back into he starts to turn back into the talisman shape next page now and which he does and so there so here's the uh he's turned back and now he's it's something that, that she can hold you know, in her, uh, in her hands. And she's kind of flirting with Conan, you know, oh yeah, uh, uh, you know, we'll, uh, you know, I fought this night for other rewards, you know, it makes him Conan sound like she's coming. He says, yeah, well, slow down girl. We got all night before us, you know, he's just a big dumb man who thinks with some organ besides his brain. And, uh, <laughs> well, you know, well, she hops on a, a, a horse carrying that crown. Next page. And, on the, and then on the last page, you know, she uh, she come, he, she says with this thing about, uh, well, it starts on the other one. No man's lips shall ever touch mine, Sumerian, save those of him who has defeated me on the field of battle. You know, and uh, I swiped that from William Butler Yeats, the, uh, the great Irish poet who at the turn of the 20th century wrote what is, after the Iliad, my favorite literary work, a short play called On Bailey's Strand about the Irish hero Cahulan. And he has a son by this woman who was a warrior and, it, and, you know, and, and she had boasted that she never had, but the one lover and he, the only man who ever defeated me in battle. And I like that idea somehow. It seemed right for Conan. I've taken a little uh, flack from, I think, misguided feminists. I mean, you know, I just, I think that, you know, I mean, this is just one character. I'm not saying this is the way things should be for all women, but that's this particular character. That was her code. It wasn't that she had to do this. Nobody made her do it. She just, that was that was what she decided. It was her choice, and somehow or other, you know, uh, oh, you know, some people get all up in arms about that, but you can't you can't help that, you know. I mean, let him argue with you, William Butler Yeats. He's been dead since the '30s, you know. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so she, she takes off the, with the, she says she did kind of like him, but she she has to take off with uh, with the thing, and Conan just accepts the fact. So he he gets mad and uh, slams into a wall and hurts his hand, which is kind of funny because about a year or two later. Barry was, uh, you know, was when he came back from England sometime a couple of years later, he he 
he was he was raging about something. He slammed his hand through some curtain. It turned out there was a big wall on the other side, and he hurt his hand and couldn't draw for several days. <laughs> so I think and this is just an example. You know, you know, it may have been it may have been the story we discussed. It may have been the way he did it. But whatever it is, you know, it's just like that's what the way Barry felt that a guy like that should handle it. it, it Conan was handling it the same way Barry was handling. Conan didn't hurt his hand quite as bad as Barry hurt his. <laughs> but, you know, they both recovered. And then, of course, you get to the end where he's he's thinking, where he says this line. And that was I was kind of telegraphing, but here he is walking toward one of those big phallic towers again. He says, uh, I best get back to barracks while I have still members left to call my own. Well, if that isn't telegraphing what that was all about, <laughs> you know, I think that... Uh, I was being a little obvious with that. I expected maybe the code would say, what do you mean members? You know, what is this members thing? That was a little strange, but we got away with it. And uh, it's interesting. I didn't even have like next issue thing on it. I put the knees. I just felt like, you know, because it was a great, because it was, it was, and it was Barry's, it was the end of Barry's time on mm -hmm. the book. So it seemed like instead of pushing the next issue, which would the next couple of issues would finish out this war and siege. I thought, well, we'll just leave it, uh, you know, this way and make Phineas. This is a Phineas to uh, Barry, and uh, we did. Was was red? I guess Red Nails came later, and uh, Barry's part work on Worms of the Earth and so forth. So we did work together a little bit, you know, after that uh, after that time. But uh, this was his swan song on the uh, Conan Color comic, and that's it. I'm sorry I don't have any great insights or anything like that, but. That's how the story was, you know, created by Barry and me. All right, Steve, you got to wrap up. What do you what, what do you think? Well, I think it's actually been quite fascinating. Uh, you know, the one thing that I always wondered about, and it's not it's not really mentioned in the story with the vulture. Uh, yeah, those little wings. Like, is he a member of a lost race? Uh, is he? No, no, they're just artificial wings. Uh, they're just they're just a design element. I, I think that I think they more or less something like that exists in Howard's story. It's like it was just a, a thing. He had a cape or some kind of thing that sort of looked like it was a cape, but it sort of looked like wings. But that's the, the interesting thing about this that I, is something I should have maybe mentioned. That particular that story ordinarily, you know, I had this view that since the, the genre was called sword and sorcery, and there was always sorcery of some kind in every Howard uh, in every Conan story. Not in all Howard stories, but every Conan story. But this was not a Conan story originally. This was a Crusades type story, and there was no sorcery in it. You know, so we so there are little touches here and there. I think there's a mention of wizardry and passing or something. But this is probably as close that that story is probably as close to a non sorcery story in Conan as, as we ever did. Uh, because uh, I just felt like I, I just liked Shadow the Vulture so much. The funny thing is, I've always wanted to adapt the actual story, Shadow of the Vulture. And back when we had that company in the 90s, Cross Plains Comics, where we had the rights to a lot of non Conan Robert E. Howard characters, uh, one of the things Raphael Kayanan, who did a wonderful job on Conan and related things, he and I were, and, and he actually drew the first bunch of pages of a. Uh, an adaptation of Shadow the Vulture in the original, you know, form, and that would have been nice to to do that. And and I always kind of wince because I feel well now somebody else will get the rights to do it and so forth. But so far the problem has been that Conan and Sonya are now owned by two totally separate groups, so that you know, and, and somehow because Shadow the Vulture is sort of a Red Sonya story and sort of not a Red Sonya story, I think there's always been this. Thing where they're not quite sure if they should if they should or could adapt it. I think that mm -hmm. that story is kind of has been considered at least up till now in some kind of, of legal twilight zone, and that's why that story has uh, has not been adapted. I'm not saying it won't be tomorrow, but all these years it's never been adapted straight. And it's too good a story not to be adapted straight. And Raphael and I were going to do it, and I've still got you know the first few two or three pages that he drew roughly of it, but. You know, I don't know if it'll ever be adapted. Yeah, you know, we I tried a couple of times to get something, but what happened is is that the lawyer, Arthur Lieberman, who was the uh, sort of the head, the main honcho of Conan Properties for a while, when this Swedish group bought them out some years ago, uh, became Conan Properties and everything. Uh, they were going to split things up, and Arthur had something coming. He would have had like a little piece of Conan, a little piece of call a little piece of this, a little piece of that, a little piece of Sonia. 
And he said, well, rather than have a little piece of something, you got to constantly be, be figuring out, you know, how much do I get of this, you know, and this and this and this. Why don't you just take everything except give me Red Sonia? So that's the reason why it takes mm. now a major contract to get Conan and Sonia together in the main story. There have been a few of them at Dynamite or wherever, uh, but they have to make a special deal now to do it because, you know, uh, Arthur passed away some years ago, but his son Luke has uh, handling it now. Oh, and of course, they're making a, uh, a movie, you know, a Red Sonja movie. Okay. Now, what about you? Well, I'm just curious because you know you, you introduce Red Sonja into the to the comic book world, right? Through this book, did you have yeah. a grander vision after you guys did this to we can do more <laughs> with this character? The closest thing I ever had to a grand vision was maybe the Kree Scroll War, and even that left a lot of detail. <laughs> fill in no uh, the only thing i knew was what i said before was that i wanted it to be somebody who could sort of wander in and out of conan's life whenever i felt like you know having him meet her and it, what was i think it was issue 43 or something around there actually it ended up being in savage sword one because we needed a story real fast to fill that but anyway basically so that was really about a year a year or, or so later that you know by that time john was there and uh, in the meantime esteban Morot, who had sent in this drawing that had a sort of the iron bikini look. And I like that. And so I had John adapt that when he drew uh, the Conan stuff to yeah. adapt the iron bikini look and so forth. You know, I, I have a more of a nostalgic admiration for the chain mail and hot pants now that I used to have. Uh, at the time, it just bothered me because it seemed too modern. The, the shorts in particular just didn't look like what I thought. But, you know, hey, you know, a, a, a good looking girl in, in short red Shorts, you know, I mean, you know, Barry, Barry wasn't entirely wrong, <laughs> you know. And of course, the Iron <laughs> Bikini thing worked out pretty well. To the point where yeah. For a while, I remember Arthur Lieberman, uh, they, they were worried about it at one stage. So they, there was a period there back around the 80 or so where that were for a while. They, and, and after, even after I came back in the late about 90 or so, uh, where for about a decade, they wouldn't let her wear the Iron Bikini. She had all kinds of other nondescript, awful outfits on, nothing that ever looked worth a damn, you know. But, oh, wow. uh, but we managed to, you know, eventually they managed to get her back into the iron bikini, but it took a while. Steve, I have one question for you. Would you ever wear the iron bikini and post up pictures on those private sites of yours until we can check it out here? I did. We can... Well, I don't need to wear the top part, but, you know, I could <laughs> probably wear like some sort of, uh, yes, you, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you can fill it out. You got it. Steve is very risky. I, I went to a party as Dread Sonia once. My wife and I, Dan and I, made a. Yeah, he uh, she, did. She's a redhead. And at one party in, in LA, about a year or so after we met, we made this thing where I was going to go to a party as. I would go as Conan, you know, the world's thinnest Conan, you know, and so forth, after a hunger strike, I guess. And she would go as Red Sonia. We had, they weren't very good costumes. There are a couple of pictures of us. Yeah, one I know. Picture I saw. Of us for that. Well, the way I got her to be Red Sonia, because she didn't really want to do it particularly, it was kind of a skippy outfit. The way I got her to do it was I promised that next year I'll go as Red Sonia and you <laughs> could go as Conan. You promise anything when it's a year away. Well, a year passes pretty quickly. And the next year, we got invited to by a couple of friends to some big, it wasn't a, a private party, it was a gathering, you know, a couple hundred people at the top of some thing on uh, New Year's Eve, whatever it was. And so that was the time I had to uh, be, or maybe it was Halloween. Yeah, Halloween party. And I had to, uh, so I had to be Red Sonia. I wore that outfit. That was okay. Dan had to do a little more strategic placing of things to play Conan, you know, but, but I, I did it. Now, she says there's some pictures around of, of that too, but I mercifully have never seen them that yeah. I can recall. Like, I don't know if I'm, if I want to see them. You know? I did. I saw the one on you <laughs> in the bikini. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, but Dan would never let me post it though. I can't understand. I can't understand that. I mean, that's Roy Thomas, you know, there's, there's <laughs> things so that are inside. I've been, I've been Conan and I've been Red Sonia and I wasn't very good. The only good thing is when I was at that party, there was one guy with his girlfriend. I remember she was Asian American, I guess, you know, the, the guy, you know, was Caucasian. They, they, they walked up to me at this thing where we'd sat back down after we had, it was a costume thing. We walked around in our costumes. They called us the Vikings. They didn't know Conan and Sonia. And uh, anyways, we came in second or third, I think, whatever. But anyway, so we sat down and this guy comes by to me and he says, I says, 
I have to. I made a bet. My girlfriend does refuses to believe that you're actually a guy. I, I don't know if I should be flattered or what. You know, but I said, well, <laughs> I am. And she was kind of skeptical, so I just reached down to my bra thing and then pulled it like that and let it go again. That convinced her, and uh, she just giggled and ran off. And that was the end of that. Wow, Red Sonia Roy, huh? Yeah. Well, you know, Dan. Roy's Dan a good time. Talk, I've been a mummy. I've been a dolphin. I've been Snow White. I mean, she could talk me into any kind of crazy costume oh, at oh. Halloween. Oh. So anyways, we'd like to thank everybody that uh, was watching this uh, two-part that Roy Thomas uh, took us on an educational tour of Conan 23 and 24. And uh, we got more guest stars coming up. And uh, hopefully we'll eventually get some other creators that can take us through their comics as well. I'd like to get more of that going too, but it's always good because it's always good to see it from their point of view and just to see like how they do it because sometimes we see it as one thing and they we, how it really happened is something. Yeah. Now, something you know, totally. it's interesting. If you had Barry on here, you would have a whole different view. You'd have you know his version of what happened because I'm saying mine. If you had the if you if by some weird coincidence you you had the two of us together, we would probably just start arguing and fighting about what happened. So you, there's three different shows there. You've got two more to do. Yeah, that, that, that would be the, the, the same, viral the same two books, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much for giving me the chance to do that, I, I, you know, and everything. Okay, Steve, get us out of here with Mighty Mystic Meal now. Boom. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us on Pop XP. If you haven't already, make sure to click that subscribe button and also click the bell for notifications when we go live and we upload some awesome new content. Also, don't forget to head on over to Twitter and follow us at the Pop XP and over on Instagram at the Pop XP. Thanks again, everyone, and we'll see you soon.